Hello again, physics friends. Today we're going to talk about central force motion and specifically the uh, system of two bodies that are experiencing a force between them that's a so-called central force. So what do we mean by central force? Well, in general, a force can depend on a position vector, but that could mean that the force depends on how far objects are from each other and also their relative orientations. But a central force is a subset of the general set of forces. Um, and specifically, a central force depends only on the magnitude of the position vector. Okay, So that means that it, it doesn't matter, there's a, a spherical symmetry that the force does not depend on angle. Okay, So we'll think about central forces in two ways. First, we'll think about them um, as one object moving um, relative to a fixed origin. So there'll be a position vector for that object. Okay, and that um, mass might be moving in some direction with a given momentum. Okay. And we can talk about the force that this object feels as a central force, meaning as long as the object is a fixed distance from the origin, it feels the same force, and that force is directed towards or away from the origin. The other situation we can consider, though, is going to um, involve more than one body. So we'll call that central force motion with, with two bodies. So it could look something like this, where we have now two masses. And we have their position vectors. And in a central force problem with these two masses, the force can only depend on how far apart these two bodies are. Okay, so we're going to have a force on mass 2 by mass 1, and that force can only depend on the separation um, between the two objects. And similarly, there'll be a force on mass 1 by mass 2. It'll point in the opposite direction. And it can only, again, depend on the separation. Those forces will be equal and opposite, same magnitude, opposite directions. So we will talk about, um, we'll start by talking about a one-body system where we just have a single particle feeling a force that's directed toward or away from the center. And once we get some intuition for that problem, we'll extend the discussion to two bodies. But let's start with a one-body system. Um, in this case, we can immediately see that if the force is radial, it will be um, the cross product of r and, a f and that force will be zero because r is um, parallel or anti-parallel to the force. So in the language of Newton's second law or Newtonian mechanics, we can see that in this one body system, there's no torque because the force is either parallel or anti-parallel to the position vector, okay? We can see this play out. The angular momentum is r cross p. And if we look at the time derivative of the angular momentum, we get a velocity cross p added to r cross dp dt. We've done this uh, derivation in the past. The first term here is 0 because dr dt is a velocity, and a velocity is parallel to a momentum. So collectively, that term is 0. The cross product of a parallel vector is 0. And the second term is um, R cross, and by Newton's second law, dp dt is the force. Okay. But if R is um, aligned with or anti-aligned with the force, then this term is also zero.
Well, this tells us that the angular momentum is conserved. Okay, so if if the angular momentum does not change, then the orbital plane is fixed. So the motion is planar. So we can think about in general this one particle could be moving in 3D, but really this tells us that the motion will be two-dimensional. Takes us from motion in space to motion in the plane. From a Lagrangian point of view, um, we can say that, um, you know, given that L is constant, that implies that um, the coordinate phi does not appear in the Lagrangian. Or another way around, if we wrote down the Lagrangian, we would find that there's no um, direct dependence on phi, therefore we can infer that the angular momentum is conserved. The beautiful thing, though, is the next thing that we'll talk about is that this system actually is going to simplify even more. There's a way to take it from a two-dimensional system to a one-dimensional system. So that's what we're going to get to next. So let's get there via the Lagrangian analysis. So the first thing we want to do is write down the Lagrangian for the system in uh, 2D polar coordinates. We know the motion is planar. And we're going to use um, r and phi as our two generalized coordinates. So let's write this down now. So using the expression for v squared in 2D polar coordinates, we have the Lagrangian written out in this way. And when we take partials, we can get the Euler-Lagrange equation for the r coordinate. And you'll notice here we have partial u, partial r. But because u only depends on r, the partial is equivalent to a full derivative of u with respect to r, which is how I've written it in the Euler-Lagrange equation for r. We can repeat this process for the um, phi um, variable. And when we compute the partial, we see that the Lagrangian does not depend on the angle phi, so the generalized force is zero, therefore the generalized momentum is conserved, and that quantity is the angular momentum. And since this quantity mr squared phi dot is conserved, we're just given a name L naught, meaning the angular momentum, and we'll put the naught in there just to stress and, and point out that this is a positive quantity. So even though r may vary and phi dot may not be constant, together the product r squared phi dot will be constant. It's important to note that this angular momentum L naught depends on the initial conditions. Um, but once you specify the initial position and velocity, um, that's, that fixes this value of L0, and it cannot change from then on out. So this idea, this, the, the fact that L0 is constant, is the added constraint that takes us from two dimensions to one dimensions, because it's going to allow us to combine the Euler-Lagrange equation um, for phi and the, the Euler-Lagrange equation for r to eliminate the phi dot term in the r equation. So let's see what that looks like. So here we have the original Euler-Lagrange equation, which has a phi dot in it, but we're going to rep replace phi dot with L naught over mr squared. And when we play this out, now we have a second-order differential equation for r, and there's no um, phi dependence. It's just a one-dimensional problem now. But we're motivated by um, trying to think of this as a one-dimensional problem, even though the, the motion actually is in two dimensions. Uh, we're motivated by trying to formulate um, this equation as if it were a single dimension. And if you think of Cartesian coordinates, um, so in Cartesian, we have ma is equal to the net force, which is minus du dx for a potential defined in one dimension. Um, so we want to try to make this Euler-Lagrange equation look like that 1D Cartesian example, the left-hand side looks pretty good, mx double dot, mr double dot. So we want to rewrite the right-hand side as the derivative of, of a potential or something that looks like a potential. So we have a DDR of u, but we want to rewrite this first term as the derivative of some function. And this will do it for us. If we think about um, taking the derivative of this quantity, we end up with what we had originally. Notice 
we used to have a 1 over r cubed, now we have a 1 over r squared. Um, and we've factored out this minus sign. Now these two have the same relative sign, whereas they didn't before, because when you take the derivative of 1 over r squared, you get a minus 1 over r cubed. Okay, so this term now is, is the derivative of two pieces. Okay, one of these pieces is the potential. The other one, you might call it a centrifugal potential, has to do with the um, angular motion of the system. So UCF of R. And collectively, the sum of these two terms, we call U effective. And with that language, the equation of motion becomes mr double dot equals minus du effective dr. This looks very much like a 1d, I put in quotes, motion. So we can summarize where we are now. We have a mass, a, a single body, feeling a force directed towards or away from a force center. So the force here is purely parallel or anti-parallel to the position vector. We use the fact that angular momentum is conserved to explain that the motion has to be planar. And then we also use the fact that angular momentum is conserved to combine the um, R and phi Euler-Lagrange equations, equations of motion, to eliminate phi dot and derivatives and express um, an equation of motion for R in a way that looks very much like Newton's second law, where mass times something that looks like an acceleration is equal to an effective force. This effective potential you have involves um, a component that's due to the angular velocity of the system, and one that is due to the actual force between um, acting on, on this mass. So if U effective really is like an effective potential, then we should be able to express the total energy of the system in terms of the kinetic energy and U effective. So can we write the total energy of the system as the kinetic energy plus U effective? Well, let's, let's look at that a bit. Well, we can start out by writing the total energy as the sum of kinetic and potential. Kinetic involves the V squared and 2D polar. The potential is just the potential. But now we're going to regroup terms, so we'll factor out the, uh, or bring out separately the 1 half m r dot squared and group the rest um, together. And what we're going to see is that this pairing of terms is the effective potential. So here we can make use of the fact that the angular momentum, which is a constant, is equal to m r squared phi dot. We can use that to replace this phi dot, much as we did before, and we find the following. So we have the kinetic energy due to the radial motion, and then here we have the kinetic energy due to the angular motion plus the potential associated with the force. And if we group those last two terms, that is exactly the effective potential. So it's not that E equals T plus U effective, but rather that E is equal to the kinetic energy, which maybe I'll call T sub R, which is the kinetic energy due to radial motion plus u effective, where t sub r is equal to this 1 half m r dot squared. Okay, and how else can we think about this effective potential? Well, if there's an effective potential, then there must be an effective force. What does that effective force look like? So when we take the derivative of this term in the u effective, l naught squared over 2 m r squared, we're going to get a minus um, 2, but we have it divided by 2, and then we get a 1 over r cubed. S then we take the minus 1 times that, and we end up with a positive l naught squared over mr cubed minus du dr. So this is our effective force. Notice that the particle um, feels the actual force plus this so-called centrifugal force. Notice also that we have radially radial and attractive versus radial and repulsive. Um, in this case, the 
this term is positive, L naught squared is positive, R is a positive number, M is a positive number. So this piece here is um, a force that pushes radially outward. So this force here is radial outward. So it forces you away from the origin. Um, this could be radially inward or radially outward, depending on the sign of du dr. Um, the term that this radially outward force has been given is the centrifugal force. It's the center fleeing force. But the main result is that we've taken a system that in principle could have been three-dimensional, and we've identified a one-dimensional equation of motion from which we could find r of t. And then once we had r of t, we could find the angle as a function of time. And that angle as a function of time um, can be obtained out of this equation. If you know r of t, l naught as your initial conditions, the mass of the system, you can use this equation um, as a way to solve for phi as a function of time. And at that point, you fully specified the system. So the main goal here is to take a, um, a one-body system, show that it reduces from 3D to 2D, 2D to effectively 1D, and that this becomes now a tractable problem. Where are we going next? Well, we want to extend this system to two particles, neither one of which is at the origin, and look at the force in between those two particles. We're going to see that we end up with a very similar result. So hopefully we've built some intuition using a more simple one-body problem, and next we'll talk about um, how to transition that to two bodies. So that's the subject for a future video, but until next time, take care and be well.